So, hello everyone, uh, welcome to Mutix and whatnot. And uh, here we have Pavel Sechin uh, from the University of Duisburg Essen, uh, and uh, which is going to talk about uh, application of Lan Weber Novikov operations and algebraic support. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have some problem with the. Uh, so I cannot see anyone anymore. I think this is okay until you can see me and hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so here is the plan of my talk. I'm gonna speak first about algebraic boarding, like from the scratch, what, what kind of object it is. And then also going to present from the scratch the construction of. Um, Sorry, Pasha, can you wait yeah. a second? We'll unmute everyone and mute you. Okay. Yeah. Is it okay now? Um, yeah, at least I tried to mute everyone, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, well, okay, no. Yeah, sorry. So somehow one window is missing from my Zoom. So, yeah. I, okay, tell me if I have to stop. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'm going to start with the constructions of algebraic cobordism and of the Weber Novikov operations. And then I'm going to talk about three different sort of problems. Um, the first one is about smoothing of uh, classes in algebraic cobordism and Chow groups. Um, so that is the question of whether a particular element of algebraic cobordism or um, of Chow groups is actually a push forward of the identity of uh, a smooth closed sub variety. And um, yeah. The, the abstractions will be will come from the Riemann Rock theorem and the self intersection formula. This is somewhat classical, I'm just gonna show how things work out when one uses Lander Bernoulli operations. Um, another thing which I'm gonna discuss is about pure cobordism motifs. So these are motifs constructed like Chow motifs, but with cobordism groups instead of Chow groups. And how the Weber Novikov operations um, get you some more information about uh, motives that maybe you expect, to, or at least maybe more than I expect. Um, and finally, I'm going to discuss um, how you can use the Weber Novikov operations to calculate sort of algebraic coordinates of curves and surfaces. Um, and there will be, so this is some sort of result, but then there will be also an open um, problem about this computation. So here's a sort of disclaimer here, the, right? As that there is no like big result of this talk. And in general, I have decided to give this particular talk because there was some, well, let's say increased interest in algebraic cobordism over the last year or two. So there were new constructions and new approaches to algebraic cobordism, different from what I'm going to talk about based on derived algebraic geometry or um, motivic homotopy theory. So there were new advances. And I have decided maybe it's, maybe, maybe, again, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's a um, good time to state some questions about algebraic cobordism, um, which might be interesting to someone who wants to study algebraic cobordism. But also, I want, really want to stress that uh, well, labor Novikov operations are very, very important in the study of algebraic cobordism. I'm not sure how, um, how well it will, how clear it will be after this talk. So that, but that's initially my goal. Um, and I have to say that, so the three problems which I'm going to mention in the talk and the answers to these questions are really, really partial. So basically, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you 
any mm, finite result about them. Okay, um, so I'm going to move to the next slide and uh, I'm going to ask you now if you have any more questions about this slide. So you please interrupt me whenever you want using the, all the tools you have, but also I think I will try to uh, particularly ask your questions after moving to each new slide. Okay. So I don't even see chat now, so hopefully someone will tell me if there are any questions. Uh, okay, so let's start with algebraic cobordism and how to construct them. We'll talk about algebraic cobordism of Levin Morel. And for that, uh, we're going to fix the field of characteristic zero, just use all the machinery which is available. And uh, we'll basically work with smooth varieties over this field, which always will be meant to be quasi projective. Okay, and suppose now that you have an irreducible smooth variety, then there is um, a construction due to Levin and Panheri Pande, which associates to this variety an abelian group called omega with um, <coughs> superscript d, which is a quotient of a free abelian group generated by all projective uh, morphisms from smooth varieties to x, up to, well, classes of isomorphisms of them, obviously. And d is the co-dimension of f, so I guess you should assume y to be reducible as well. And then you quotient this free abelian group by what's called double point relations, which I'm going to explain now. Okay, so these are double point relations. So uh, our x is this x, and now we have a sort of, um, well, I have to say that these double point relations are sort of a generalization of classical um, cobordance relation which was studied by topologists. And uh, well, instead of line, we have a projective line here. And we have a projective morphism from a smooth variety where X times P1. So this is sort of like, I know, <clears throat> this is a family of uh, uh, varieties of projective varieties over X parameterized by the projective line. And uh, uh, we assume that the fiber <coughs> over zero is a smooth divisor in W, and the fiber over one is a, well, let's have it in here, reduced strict normal crossing divisor uh, with uh, two components. So it just means that there are two reducible components, Y and C, which are smooth. So, um, reduced uh, divisors, reduced smooth divisors in W, and they intersect transversely so that their intersection is uh, smooth um, <coughs> co-dimension to sub-variety of W. So <coughs> uh, maybe better to say that it's also like equidimensional, yeah. Okay. Um, so this guy is smooth and this is sort of not, and we want to relate the class of this uh, fiber to the class of this fiber. So of course this is, there is a, a well-defined class of this fiber because this is smooth variety and this is a um, projective morphism. So it is an element of algebraic cobordism of X. And here, yeah, I have to write this double point relation. It will not be super important for later, um, but here it is. So you have to take these two components separately, which will be smooth uh, projective, uh, sorry, smooth varieties which are projective over X. And then you'll have also to take the minus OL, some construction over their intersection, which is a projective bundle of something. Okay, 
So, so this is a double point relation. And so this gives you algebraic bordism. And you can see that it is sort of really easily defined and very geometric. But surprisingly, maybe it has a very, very rich structure. <clears throat> OK. So uh, just a remark that in this double point relation. Hello? Yeah. The, Tom has a question. OK, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my question is, is this, this last term with a projective whatever, is this obviously symmetric in Y and Z? Yeah, it's almost obviously symmetric because <clears throat> so the, let, let's see, <clears throat> let's see. So the claim is that the normal bundle of D in Y is dual to the normal bundle of D in Z and therefore uh, the projectivization will be equivalent as a projective, uh, as, a, as a variety over D, okay? And, yeah, makes sense to me. Yeah, and why is that? Uh, <clears throat> so, um, let's see. <clears throat> I mean, I'm willing to believe it. That was it's just something which occurred to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a very easy question. And, uh, Let's, yeah, it's a good question. Why not to answer it? Uh, let's just um, give me a sec. And <clears throat> um. Okay, there's been also another question, but maybe I'll leave you first try to answer this one. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I think it's better to read the other question. Pasha is uh, whether you can live this to a coherent object like a spectrum or something. Uh, I have really no idea. See, so, uh, <clears throat> I want to say that the um, restriction of uh, the line bundle coming from the, the divisor W1 to D is trivial, which would give you the claim because <clears throat> that's, uh, so this divisor is like O of Y plus Z, and when you restrict to Z, it gives you exactly the O Y is dual to uh, of Z over D, which are the normal bundles. And uh, I think you should easily see that this is a trivial line bundle over D, but I, sorry, I cannot do it on the spot. This should be sort of obvious, but I forgot how. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks for a good question. Um, yeah, uh, what I was going to say that if um, there is this other divisor is also smooth. So there is no second component, say Y, and there is no intersection D, then it is just the usual naive cobordism relation. And so I'll make one argument using this relation instead of the real double point relation just to explain some, some proof. But you really need these double point relations. You can't just go with naive cobordism relations in algebraic cobordism. Okay. What are the properties of this guy? So I, I'll state them in rather random order and I'll also explain some of the properties uh, which I state now later. So for example, I claim that the algebraic bordism is a commutative uh, graded ring. So grading has nothing to do with commutativity. Everything is really commutative on the nose. And the identity element in this ring is of course the identity map from X to X. So at least in the uh, the zero is co-dimension. Okay, then there are pullbacks. So for any morphism in smooth quasi-projective varieties from V to X, there is a pullback morphism um, which preserves grading and is a morphism of rings. Uh, 
and I'll explain in a second how sometimes you can compute this pullback. There is also a push forward map. So if you have a projective morphism in, uh, again, smooth body projective varieties, which is of code dimension C, then, um, and again, let's assume that X and T are irreducible, I think. Then the push forward map is really easily described. You just take the composition of the map and it's really easy to check that it is a well-defined thing. Mm -hmm. And a very important property of algebraic cobordism is the transversal base change, uh, which tells you that suppose you have this um, fiber square in a smooth variety, so I assume that the, this um, pullback is also a smooth variety, and H is projective, and these two morphisms are transversal, which for smooth varieties just means that uh, yeah, whatever. Um, so I don't want to give you a definition. Let's say that uh, whatever it means that they are transversal. But if, uh, for example, F is a regular embedding, then <clears throat> transversality is exactly the claim that this guy here, the pullback, uh, has right co dimension and Y. Again, equidimensional, I guess. <clears throat> and in this case, you have this um, base change, which tells you that if you can, you can go from Y to V in two ways. Either you go, first you take a push forward, and then you take a pullback, or first you take a pullback, and then you take a push forward. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you have seen it before, if you even you, even if you haven't seen algebraic cobordism, because this is exactly the base change in um, K theory, and get it, and it works exactly under the same assumptions. So, um, well, this tells you how you can compute pullback in some situations. So, in this situation, the pullback of this guy is this guy. Why? Because this guy, y to x, is the push forward, h push forward of the identity, y. So the push forward is described here, it sends you the identity y to the morphism y to x. And then you can interchange them and get that this is um, the h, uh, prime, h prime um, push forward of the pullback of f prime identity, but the pullback of identity is always identity um, because we we say that we, I've told you that it is a um, morphism of commutative rings. So it allows you to compute a pullback in this situation. And the multiplication can also be described using pullbacks. So if you want to um, multiply two classes, say y to x with v to x, you take their external product, which lives on x times x, and then you pull it back using the diagonal on x. <clears throat> For example, if y and v are transversal smooth sub varieties of x, then their intersection is th uh, their products in this algebraic origin is their intersection. So, yeah, looks very natural. One more property is that there exist germ classes of vector bundles with values in algebraic cobordism. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to speak how to construct them, but, um, but at some point we'll talk about the first germ class a little bit more, I think. So the germ classes, um, these are morphisms of pre shifts from smooth varieties to sets which are quite variant, which means that they commute with pullbacks and they don't commute with push forwards. So th that's exactly like uh, usual chern classes from K0 to say chern classes, or sorry, to Chowers or classical cohomology theories. And they also satisfy the classical Cartan's formula or Whitney-Sum formula, whatever you call it. 
um, one another nice property is that Hatchback Borden is the, the universal oriented cohomology theory. So that for any other oriented cohomology theory, which is roughly, and I don't want to give you a full definition, is the theory with pullbacks and pushforwards. And then there exists a unique uh, natural transformation of these matters, which respects both pullbacks and pushforwards. And this is morphism of uh, community of rings, pre shifts of community of rings. And um, last but not least is that, well, this algebraic embodism constructed very geometrically uh, has relation to K theory and char groups. Uh, and uh, it tells you that to, to get from algebraic abortion to okay, K-theory, you have to just to um, change the coefficients of this algebraic abortion. So there is algebraic abortion of the point of the spec K. It's a rather big uh, abelian group, which we'll discuss at some point later. And to get K-theory, you just have to take all the relations which come from, from um, from this map, from algebraic borders of a point to k0 of a point. So what are these relations? It tells you that two, what are the new relations? Two uh, projective varieties over the spec k uh, shall be now equivalent whenever they have the same Euler characteristic of the structure sheet. And if you take these relations and pull them back to algebraic border over x, then you get exactly k zero of x, and similarly for charms. I have a I have a question. Yeah, uh, is this does this work also for higher k groups? Is a Land Weber exact functor sort of formula? So well, so for, in this algebraic version, of course, there are no higher k groups, right? So this is only like the the say it's the geometric part of the MGL, it's like MGL two stars there, right? But whenever you have uh, a Lat Weber exact theory, uh, then it can be obtained from MGL just by tensoring. That's correct. But in this case, so for example, Chavo is not Lat Weber exact, but we still get the size mode. Does it sound okay to you? Yeah. Okay. I see. Oh, I see. So omega star is not really, I shouldn't think of it like as all the cobordism group in topology is just sort of a, 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 a piece. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a uh, good one. I, I don't think I can explain it better than you said. Okay. okay. Yeah. The question. So should I think of this last isomorphism as some miracle for child groups? Because you're saying it's not Landerberg exact. Oh, it's not a miracle. It's just it comes from it comes from the yeah. It's not a miracle now. Uh, it's just that. Uh, so well, what's Landerberg exactness? Landerberg exactness tells you that uh, when you tensor uh, your things over Lazarin, um you tensor your exact sequences over Lazarin, They stay exact. Okay, that's uh, a very good property, uh, but what about exactness here? So for algebraic cobordism of Levin Morel, the exactness, the excision sequence or the localization sequence is only exact on the right. I'm not, I was, it's now written in my notes, so I cannot present it to you now. So, but it's in, you've seen it definitely. It's a exact sequence which is exact on the right. And whenever it is exact, if you have an exact sequence which is exact on the right and you tether it with whatever, it stays exact. And it is exact on the right because of that's how the motivic category works. It has nothing, it, it's a no miracle. So if you, you can take any um, representable uh, cohomology, motivic oriented cohomology theory so that it should be like a free theory in some sense. I don't know how to explain it in the homotopy world. And then the same relation will hold. It doesn't have to be child root, could be anything, morality theory or anything else. Um, uh -huh. 
Does it help? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next slide unless you have more yeah, questions. I have one more. I, mm -hmm. I, um, so uh, do you happen to know if there's an analogous theorem for uh, oriented chow, maybe using MSL? <clears throat> um, I don't know, but I don't think that for MSL, so again, this is MGL two star star. So it's just only part of MGL. And uh, for MSL, uh, for the geometric part of MSL, MSL two star star, I don't think there is an analogous description like here. And for MSL- you uh, think there's a, an analog of, sorry, an, what kind of description? The of like point? yeah, double point. Well, like what what should be what should be the generator, and what should be the relation? So okay, maybe generator generator. Maybe you can guess, but what kind of uh, how to uh, write the relations explicitly? Probably I think nobody knows, but I'm not an expert on this really. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, I can see Sorry, somebody who's right. Question. Yeah. By Simon. Um, yes, so if you if you take these strand classes from K0 to omega i and you compose with the the quotient map from algebraic cobalt to K0, what, what do you get? So, you, so you'll get uh, classes from K0 to K0, right? Yes. Uh, so this, uh, that's what also called churn classes of K-theory. So they are related to lambda operations, but not exactly like lambda operations. They're sort of uh, there are formulas which represent one operations in terms of another. So it's a very classical thing if you open, uh, so I mean, it's just a thing which can be related to lambda operations in a very certain way, you know, which is written like in Grothendix, um papers. Um, so for example, the first churn class of a line bundle from K0 to K0 is I think this line bundle minus the structure sheaf, or there is another version. I'm not sure which one is correct in this case. Uh, structure sheaf minus the dual of this line bundle, and all higher chain classes are uh, defined by the first chain class and the Cartan's formula. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your questions. Uh, I think I'll move to the next slide. Oh, okay. Um, maybe we'll have to be to skip some things. So I want to remind you the con construction of von Weber norm of operations. Uh, <coughs> and it's really classical, I guess. This is the construction which Novikov has used to probably Len Weber as well. So if you have a tuple of non-negative integers, you can have like a churn class uh, with the index of this tuple, like here. And it lives in, if it lives in the algebraic version, it it's lives in this group, where this guy is this sum. Um, and now we want an operation from algebraic origin to algebraic origin. So we want to take a class of a, of a variety y to x and send it to another class of some other um, projective variety over x. Unfortunately, there is no very geometric construction to do that, but there is a construction which is through churn classes of the tension bundle. So we take the class of y and we send it to some churn classes of the tension bundle of y uh, uh, yeah, the push forward over x. So the claim is that this is well defined, so it preserves double point relations, and it also commutes with uh, push forwards. And the fact that it commutes with push forwards is rather obvious because of the way we have to find push forwards. And I have written down the proof how to show you that it respects naive cobordism relations. Here is the proof. Uh, the idea is that you, I'm gonna get fast through this proof. So not probably not with all the details, but uh, the idea is that, so these squares are transversal. So we could apply this transversal base change uh, 
thing. And uh, the tension bundles of these two varieties are actually come from one vector bundle or virtual vector bundle on W here. So it's uh, the tangent bundle of this guy minus the line bundle defining these divisors. And it's this line bundle is the same for both divisors because of the way we define them. <laughs> and because of that, basically everything works out. So instead of going this way, you can go through this way. And the last thing you have to check is that pullbacks here on x times p1 are the same for both these two maps. And well, you have to prove that, but this is sort of a one invariance property of algebraic coordinate. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it was really helpful, but so these are the operations, classical ones, but we want a slightly different version of them, which is a multiplicative operation. And it commutes not with push forwards, but with pullbacks. And whatever, whenever I sell later an operation to all this mean that it computes with pullbacks, not push forwards. To do that, you fix um, a power series gamma with coefficients p1, b2, and so on, which are just variables, independent variables. And to each vector bundle, you can associate the toad class of it, um, defined in the by the following formula. So it will be sort of multiplicative in vector bundles. So for a sum of vector bundles, it will be the product of classes. And it's defined using the uh, the roots of V. So it will be complicated formula in terms of chain classes of V, but which is easily written whenever you, your V is a direct sum of line bundles, uh, sort of with chunk classes, first chunk classes, lambda i. Um, so this is how you define the dot class. And then the claim is that let's uh, define the total of the Bernoulli operation S by the formula that it sends the class of y to the following guy. It will be push forward of the, of the tot class of um, the tangent bundle of y. And then you have to uh, to use also the tangent bundle of x to make it uh, commutative with pullbacks. So this guy, again, as I said, tall class of ty, this is a complicated formula. It's a, um, it's a polynomial with coefficients b1, b2, and so on, so that the coefficients of a monomial of b's um, the coefficient of the monomial of B is, yes, is a sort of this generalized chain class of the TY or linear combinations of them. So it just takes what we have done before in sort of, um, in sort of uh, takes um, many of what we, many of these operations before with some coefficients together. So, uh, yeah. Can I interrupt? Yeah. So there's a question in chat by Michael Bondarco. Uh, it says, I am surprised by the fact that one does not have to invert any primes to obtain this operation. Do I miss something? Uh, well, I don't know why Michael is surprised. So I don't know. Uh, you don't have to invert anything. And maybe the reason for that is that here, the coefficients of x is exactly one here. If it was uh, usually you have to invert the not the coefficient of x here. And here it's one, so you don't have to invert anything. Um, it's uh, the best answer I can give right now. Okay. So please tell me if there is a follow-up question or whatever. So this is the total of the of operation, and this is like. Um, what I think is a very important part of algebraic Borgism. Um, some, just one uh, property of that is that whenever you apply it to the first chunk class of a line bundle, what you get is exactly this power series gamma of this first chunk class of a line bundle. And you can easily check it by yourself when this line bundle is, uh, um, 
uh, of D where D is a smooth divisor, because in this case, it, it can be defined as the push forward of the identity of D, and you can compute, compute this formula. Check this one. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide if there are no more questions about this one. Okay. Uh, okay, so how can we use these operations? So there is a, a really sort of classical way to do that, going back to 70s or whatever. Uh, the problem of smoothing of classes. So you have um, some classes and which break borders, which are obtained not by any projective morphism to X, but by a regular embedding of certain co-dimension K. And if the problem is whether we can do uh, distinguish these elements from other elements in this algebraic cobordism or not. So maybe for some of you, it is an artificial questions, question. Uh, it was uh, very important for topologists um, 60 years ago, and they have solved that, but algebraic geometries ha have not solved it. So it's still open for, uh, for example, child groups. Of course, for algebraic cobordism as well. And there are some positive results about child groups in, for a small dimension by Hironaka and Clayman. And there, was, there is a negative result uh, about child groups or child groups model 2 uh, by uh, three authors. And it, this result will be man mentioned on this slide below. So how I, I'm going to talk only about uh, some restrictions on these classes and which come from these two formulas. The first formula is sort of self-intersection formula. Uh, that's how it looks. So K is the co-dimension of Z in X. N is the, um, I haven't written down, N is the normal vector bundle of Z in X. Um, hope you've seen this formula before. And then there is the Riemann rock formula, which is sort of the way we have defined uh, the, to the total operation S. Uh, okay, so how does it produce any restrictions? Well, the thing is that when you compute this guy, so suppose you know this element I star 1z, then using this formula, using the action of linder of operations, you are able to calculate uh, these classes, I push forward of C, of uh, like the generalized chain classes of N. So you can compute them and then you can multiply them like here and obtain another class like that. And it is a relation between these classes which are computed from the element I push forward 1Z using S. And these are non-trivial equations. That's basically my point. But note uh, first that they are non-trivial equations, definitely only if the co-dimension of C and X is uh, small. So it's smaller than half of the dimension of X because otherwise when you multiply any of these guys, you'll get zero for trivial reasons. Okay. <laughs> well, the first sort of computation tells you the answer or partial answer to what these equations mean in co-dimension one in algebraic borges. Um, so if you have co-dimension one, then the normal bundle is a line bundle and there exists nothing else except for the first chain class of it. And you have therefore these classes, you can multiply them to get these classes. And using the formula on the previous slide of how S acts on the first chain class of um, uh, a divisor, first class of the line bundle. So I push forward of one is a, a first class of the line bundle O of D where D is Z of co-dimension one. Mm. So you get this formula and you see that it's just the formula that S should act on this element exactly as gamma. So if alpha was a first chain class of some line bundle, then we would have this equation. But these equations here, uh, these equations here, they transform to this 
one total equation here, which tells you that our class should be behave as if it was as if it were a um, class of a divisor. Moreover, um, one can show that if you forget about the torsion in algebra equivalent, then uh, alpha will be the first check class of the some line bundle, and this line bundle can be obtained from alpha just by going from algebraic equivalent to Chow groups. It lives in it would live in Picard, and then you could, from the Picard, take the first chain class, and you'll get these equations. But that's true only rationally. But uh, yeah, um, for example, if your variety has no torsion, then that's uh, exactly the uh, equation you'll get, for example, for projective space. Okay, so this is just an example, maybe not the most interesting one. Uh, Another example when you can do the computations is for some some uh, projective homogeneous varieties. For example, for some quadrics, you know that you know how to compute algebraic cobordism uh, because the map to algebraic closure is injective, and over the algebraic closure, this is a very easy thing to study because this variety is sort of algebraic cellular. Um, and note that these equations that we have written down here are they they commute with the these equations they commute with the base change of the base field so you can check them after some uh, well they will be probably weaker after base change in general but you can still write them down after base change of the base field to say algebraic closure or whatever and you can check in this case that you really get some non-trivial relations on some classes and you can also show that some elements of child groups of the Vista quadric are not uh, smoothable using the information about algebraic cobordism and using um, the relation between algebraic cobordism and child groups. And the, the example which I've mentioned before by Hartshorn and Reese Thomas is about is only about on, on uh, over an algebraically closed field, uh, and that's just the Grassmannian of three hyperplanes in six-dimensional vector space. And they have used instead of Flandebinovkov operations, of course, they've used Steenroth operations on child groups, and they've shown that uh, the second churn class of the topological vector bundle on this variety is not smoothable. And you can repeat this computation on algebraic cobordism. It's uh, some work to do that, but you can do that um, and you'll get uh, sort of integral restrictions to classes. So uh, I, I, I hope that they would get more examples before this talk, but I have not succeeded. So this is all I've got to tell you about this problem and we'll move to the next problem. So, which is not related to this one. So if you have any questions about this one, please ask me right now. Okay. Um, another thing related to algebraic boredism is motives. Um, and I think this is um, th this is a more interesting topic for me, so I'm gonna not go so fast as in the previous slide. So if you have smooth projective variety, then you can get a composition of correspondence product on the uh, say cobordism of codimension dim x in x times x. So this is obtained is for child groups, like using the push forward and pullback from x times x times x. And it's a non-commutative product, so this is a non-commutative ring. And using this structure, um, convergence motives, as well as child motives or k0 motives or whatever. And the objects of this category, and I'm going to uh, describe them precisely because later I will claim that some diagram of 
functors is commutative on the nodes, so I want to be sure that we are talking about the same categories here. Um, so the objects are triples, smooth projective variety uh, number, and a projector in this uh, non commutative ring. And the morphisms are uh, obtained from this group of a cobordism from x uh, from on x times y of certain co-dimension. So if m and n are equal to zero, then it will be just co-dimension y, which is exactly what you get if you have a morphism from x to y and consider its graph. And then you have to apply these projectors on both sides. Uh, and the functor m sends variety x to x diagonal zero and the morphism to again as I said the class of uh, the graph. Uh, you can define these guys for any oriented theory as I said for example with child groups and the morphisms of theories definitely give you a more a functor between these categories of monocubes and you get a functor from pure motifs over algebraic cobordism to the pure motifs of uh, like the classical Chow motifs, pure Chow motifs, so, um, yeah, which Grothnik has introduced. And uh, not a very difficult theorem by Vishik and Yigita, but a very nice observation is that this functor induces an isomorphism on isomorphism classes of objects. Um, and also, I should have written that you can lift. Uh, projectors from this category to this category using this function. So for example, if you have a projective space, I hope you know that the motive of it in child groups is a direct sum of sort of what's called Tate motives. Uh, so Z0, Z1, and so Z n. Uh, again, so this is a notation of where pure motives, so if you are uh, more used to the notation of triangulated categories, then uh, Z1 should be Z2 in square brackets, to, uh, yeah, two in square brackets and one in uh, these brackets. Um, okay, and then, so you know it's say for child motive of the projective space and the claim is, of Fischer and Yigita that the same holds for uh, the motive of the projective space in the Kupoides motive. But the important thing here, for us important, is that in fact, there, uh, compared to the situation of child motives, there are a lot of morphisms from between these three objects. So in child motives, there are no, no non-trivial morphisms between uh, different Tate motives, and uh, automorphism of a Tate motive is just C. And here, if whenever n is bigger than m, oh, m is bigger than n, then there are morphisms from z of n to z of m, which come from algebraic abordism of a point, which are non-trivial negative degrees. Well, and the, this thing uh, you'll, uh, gives you a very non-canonical decomposition like here. So in child groups, again, all these um, motives are non-isomorphic, there are no morphism between them. Therefore, this decomposition is sort of almost unique. So it's uh, unique up to automorphisms of these objects, which are uh, Z modulo two identity of minus one. But here, nothing is unique anymore and sort of non-canonical at all. And this is, uh, surprisingly at least to me, leads to some new phenomena. Um, and to explain them, let me construct more functors between categories of motives. So given a multiplicative operation, for example, think about the total and the Bernoulli operation, or if you want, you can think about the usual chain character, which should land in child groups tensor Q here. Um, then you can form a functor between corresponding categories of pure motifs, but because an operation commutes with pullbacks and not with push forwards, 
you have to sort of twist the action of this uh, multiplicative operation. You cannot just take its essence alpha to phi of alpha because it will not give you a morphism of categories. There are different ways to twist this guy, which all come from the Rimirov theorem, and we'll choose this way because of the following nice property that if we choose this way, then we'll get a, a commutative diagram of uh, funders. So if you have smooth projective varieties, you can go to A motifs, then apply this functor coming from a multiplicative operation, and then uh, B motifs, uh, but also you could go from to B motive directly, and it is commutative, and I have to stress it again, third time, it's it is commutative on the nose. Okay, so how does it help us? Well, it sort of tells you that, uh, well, it tells you first of all that so these functors preserve uh, like a morphism between motives which come from morphisms between varieties. And uh, for example, the operation S gives you a functor from motives of uh, omega to motifs over omega with some additional coefficients, which is exam again another oriented theory. And there is also a functor which just comes from the morphism of theories from algebraic coordinates to algebraic coordinates with these coefficients added. And you can sort of write a, a necessary condition for a morphism between motifs to come from a morphism between varieties, which is that this functor uh, shouldn't uh, do anything to this morphism, uh, yeah, to this morphism alpha from m of x to m of y. Okay, and we'll call such morphisms invariant, or maybe von Weber Novikov invariant. Well, and finally, the proposition is that if you look at two, for two varieties, say uh, two particular varieties the projective space of um, odd dimension and the quadric of odd dimension, then their motifs, their char motifs, are of this form, both, as I've written before, and therefore isomorphic, and therefore their Kaburgis motifs are also isomorphic as motifs. But the claim is that there are no, uh, oh sorry, it shouldn't be weakly in where it should be just, whatever, uh, just forget about this word weakly there are no invariant isomorphisms between these two motifs. So somehow the geometry of these two varieties appears in how Alan Weber Novikov operations act on um, cabordism groups related to these varieties. Uh, and so it, tell, it gives you a way to like well, I don't know how, how good this way is, but it tells you that you can use Kaborgius motifs in a more uh, refined way than Chow motifs. So this result of Vishikigita, of course, tells you that at some point, at some level, nothing new happens, but in fact, something new happens. So you could have, uh, yeah, well, this, this is an example of something new, and you can ask what kind of, uh, isomorphism between motifs can be sorted out with this, with the help of that. Uh, I don't know, I haven't really done the computation for small dimensional varieties and I think it will not be so helpful. So it will, won't be true that if you have um, non-isomorphic uh, like curves, then their motifs uh, will be uh, definitely Non, non invariantly will not be invariantly isomorphic. But uh, let me make a small conjecture here that that should be true for projective homogeneous varieties. And there are many examples of when projective homogeneous varieties have the same uh, child motive. So this is a sort of a conjecture with a big number of with a big list of varieties. Uh, yeah, so 
uh, this was really surprising to me when I have noticed that, that even though objects are two objects in the category are isomorphic, then there is a way to say that they're non canonical, or that there are no canonical isomorphisms between them using some additional information. Sorry, um, question. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So, for those who have very short memory, uh, can you repeat again? So, what is F and F? So, one, I'm, I'm just uh, stealing some time to see the whole picture again. So, the Latin F was. Uh, the canonical map from Cobordian to child groups, right? Uh, so it's, there is a confusion in notation. So you mean, so there's F on the left hand side, and there's F on the right hand side, and they are different. Yes, right? I need, I would like, can you please repeat again, which things to degree? So there's like on the right hand side, so this F and F, can you please? So they, uh, uh, so this F have nothing to do with each other, except for they both come from the same uh, idea that Morphisms of uh, oriented theories yield natural functors on motives. So whenever you have something which preserves both push forwards and pullbacks, then you just apply it to uh, your classes in the category of motives, and it works out well. And that's what this functor latin f means, right? So this is sort of uh, a trivial or obvious functor. Okay. On the other one. Uh, the other one, this phi, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So it is constructed from the uh, multiplicative operation S, which was called uh, the total and Lebrinovikov operation. Ah, I see. Here it is. It goes from algebraic cobordism to algebraic cobordism with coefficients b1, b2, and so on. And the construction goes as follows. You have to twist the uh -huh. how this operation uh, applies with the tot plus of the tangent bundle of the second right. So there is a question from Eldon, if yeah. um, they differ by a top, these two F and F, F and phi, do they differ by a top class? No, of course not. So this guy F is sort of trivial. So it has, it, it's like a stupid inclusion, I would say. So it doesn't know anything about these coefficients, B1, B2, and so on. On the other hand, this class, this uh, this other functor S, so this separation S, it messes up a lot. So it uh, sends a class to, uh, in general, it sends a class to some polynomial in this variables B i, and the dot class is also a polynomial in this variables B i, and uh, they uh, somehow should cancel out for uh, classes which come from. Um, Morphism of varieties, but they will not cancel out for other classes. But so if I just took identity, they would agree, right? I hope. Uh, the identity of what? I mean, okay, if alpha is the most stupid thing in the world. Yeah, well, any function sends then, identity to. Okay, good. So I see. So there was another question. Oh, God, there are many questions. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, let's go. Uh, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, Eldon asks again if invariant means something like fixed under all Landwebert Novikov operations. Uh, well, I guess yes and no, or maybe no and yes. So any particular Landwebert Novikov operation does not enter this, pic this picture because uh, I don't know, I don't think you can use a particular on the Bernovikov operations to construct some functor. You, you need to know how it relates with multiplicativity uh, of uh, algebraic cobordism. So there is no, for any particular uh, on the Bernovikov operation, which I see, for example, I didn't say, didn't call it this way, but you can take a coefficient of some monomial in these, it will give you an operation from algebraic cobordism to algebraic cobordism in other uh, degree. It will be an additive operation, but of course it will not be multiplicative and uh, and it will not give you a function between categories of motives. So in this sense, the answer is no. But on the other hand, what you can also do is you can take the values of this B, that you can take, you can take this BIs and send them to certain elements of the algebraic cobordism of the point. And so you'll, 
you have like the composition from here to again to algebraic borgism, sending bi to some classes of some varieties. And you'll get the multiplicative operations from algebraic origin to algebraic origin. And, uh, and uh, okay, this will be, this will give you an, like an auto equivalence of this category here on omega, but I think uh, it will be, if you, you, you do it for all the choices of bi's, I think the, the, this is what I called weakly invariant, but I didn't write it. Um, I think it's weaker than the invariant. Okay, so for so in some sense, yes, but not exactly. Okay. So uh, I also saw that there was a question from Tom. Tom, are you still? Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm basically asking about the same thing. So it seems to me that in this category of pure motives, the the, the sort of the home sets are basically algebraic cobordism groups, which yep. means that they are sort of. Uh, MU star MU co-modules? No, they're not even Lazar modules. They're not modules over Lazar. This is a particular gra graded component of algebraic comparison. It has no this uh, category of pure motives of algebraic yeah, comparison. I mean, not if I add up all the twists, do I then get an MU star MU co-module? Like, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. So you get sort of uh, quasi coherent uh, Chief of categories here, if you, that's what you're asking. Right, right, but but then what I mean is, does invariant mean the same thing as an invariant of a comodule? But I don't know what that means because this now you have like uh, this comodule is a comodule, like what a comodule is like a comodule of categories. What you get is maybe a, so what you get is uh, so these comodules you're talking about are just quasi coherent chiefs on the moduli stack of formal groups. And uh, here, what you get instead of that, you get sort of quasi coherent shifts of categories uh, on the stack of formal groups. And uh, um, the invariant means invariant in the usual sense, but transfer it to this picture. But I have never really thought about how to do it correctly. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can I also ask a, a sillier question? Yeah. yeah. So you're saying that these two moti two omega motives are isomorphic. Yeah. So these two, right? Yeah. So this is confusing to me because then the property of being an invariant isomorphism <laughs> is it is a model dependent thing. It's not something that's canonical, right? Because if I did only canonical operations, only categorical operations, then I wouldn't be able to distinguish uh, between isomorphic objects. So, so it's a question about, uh, so there are two questions, there are two things here, I think, and I don't know all the answers, I guess. So first of all, so you have, so we're talking about isomorphism only, so you can forget about well, other morphs in the category, and you consider it just as a groupoid, right? And you have so you have a groupoid of uh, this of this category of motifs, and uh, basically we sort of apply some or equivalences of this category to distinguish between two objects in this groupoid. And um, well, you are saying basically that for every groupoid. Uh, there, there is always an auto equivalence, which like they, that all objects in the group point are um, cannot be distinguished by auto equivalences of this group point. I don't know if this statement is true. It's uh, I have tried to think about it for some time, but not for long. So I don't know if it's true. It could be not true. This is one thing, and the other thing is that we don't use all auto equivalences here, but we also have this picture here, which is the most important one, that together with our category of PM omega, we also have a functor from the category of smooth projective varieties, which is, and we always look at the functors, and the functors, or some functors, which fix this sort of, well, not subcategory, but fix this functor. No, sure, but... So this is a new information for the category, and we use that. 
and that, then I guess when you think about that, then it's not so uh, uh, well. Like this is another information you have to consider when you think about your categorical um, considerations, right? Yeah. But okay. Uh, thank you. I'll have to think about this. But yeah, I, I, I like I thought for it about like really several days. It was really confusing. So you have a category, uh, and you have two isomorphic objects in it, but they are functors which, on, on the like end of functors from this category, which act on these objects in a different way. That's, that's on nice. the one hand, it's like okay, yeah, that's that definitely should be the case. But on the other hand, like oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, was there another question or? Yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't see any, uh, I can't see the chat now, I cannot see the raised hand, so could there anyone tell? No questions and no new questions and no raised hands. Uh, okay. I mean, okay, there, there was a question that was answered in chat, but maybe I'll ask it again. So you should think of this by, by Vovas's needle. Uh, do you, should you think of this uh, these notion of invariant as something that's supposed to come from a morphism of varieties? Like yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so this is a rest, so uh, this is a restriction for a class to come from a morphism of varieties. So it's definitely not true that it's uh, or that the class of invariants invariant morphisms are just the morphisms which come from varieties, but it, it includes this class, and this is the whole point. Okay, I thought, I hope that answers it, and uh, I'll then move to the last topic. I have um, about seven minutes, so we'll have to be fast, but then um, the material here is maybe more classical especially to people who study algebraic topology. So there is the universal property of the operation S of the total and the binomial operation, which I have not discussed before because I thought like, yeah, I mean, it's interesting in itself, but it's also interesting because um, it relates to these comodules, which uh, Tom Bachman mentioned, and relates to this chromatic picture, which topologists have studied. Uh, okay, so first recall that there is a formal group law associated to every oriented cohomology theory and in particular to algebraic cohomology, and it's defined using this formula. So if you want to calculate the first year class of the tensor product of two line bundles, you have to use some formal power series in term uh, in uh, line bundles of this L and M, and it will have coefficients in the um, coefficient ring computer theory. So in our case, um, algebraic origin of a point. And uh, the existence of this formal group law gives you morphism from the Lazar ring, which uh, represents or co-represents formal group laws to the algebraic origin of a point. And a very important theorem of levin Marel which is uh, like a equivalent observation of universality of origin is that this is an isomorphism. Uh, and this allows you to construct many cohomology theories from formal group laws. You just take a ring, you take a formal group law, and then you base change it using the morphism from the Lazar ring to R uh, coming from this formal group law and using this canonical isomorphism from the Lazar ring to you the algebraic origins of the point. So this is called a free theory, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Chow groups and K0 are free theories. So the first reasonable question is, are these free theories related between each other if we have uh, two formal group laws which are isomorphic? And we'll discuss strict isomorphisms which are given by formal power series which start with the identity one times x plus something and uh, the 
uh, like morphism part of the formal group loss is described by this formula. Hopefully I haven't messed up gamma with gamma inverse. Okay, and to emerge such isomorphism of formal group loss, one can associate a multiplicative, like convertible operation, so sort of multiplicative isomorphism, which does not commute with push forwards uh, in a like classical way. I don't want to discuss it now, but uh, yeah. But the thing is that um, all these multiplicative operations are actually obtained from this total on the Bernovikov operation by sort of base ch change of coefficients. So you have, um, this is our Landerberg Novikov operation. This is a morphism of theories, the canonical one, which can use with push forwards, pullbacks, ring structure. And this is a morphism which is obtained from the canonical morphism from this algebraic version to here. And you have to send these coefficients somewhere and you send them to the coefficients of this gamma, so, so to the coefficients, uh, to the elements of R. And it is a unique, uh, there is a unique such P, so that uh, this is a commutative diagram of, uh, of uh, operations. So it's, everything commutes with pullbacks, but not everything commutes with push forwards. So, uh, by the way, you can also obtain steamroll operations in this way on child groups modular P. Um, but what's important for us is that <coughs> S is um, responsible for all strict isomorphism between formal group laws. And uh, basically, this gives omega structure of a co module over the Hopf algebraid, which co represents this. Um, uh, Pre for group voids coming from formal group laws with strict isomorphism between them. In another language, you say that this is a quasi coherent shift over the uh, stack of formal groups. I've written down here like a, a, a definition and a proposition of what it means for, for a, a Lazar module to be co module or a quasi coherent shift. But I'm sorry, we don't have time for that because running out of time. Um, so the important thing here is that you can use all the results about um, these quasi-coherent shifts over the stack of formal groups. And there are lots of results by Landweber who have described very precisely how this category behaves. And there is a geometric intuition coming from the geometric study sort of of this stack, which was not available to Land Weber. Um, and you can use these statements to obtain results about algebraic cordism. And uh, I, I don't think you have time for the proof, so let me just give you the statement. Uh, it appears also in a paper by Igite, but uh, I don't understand his proof and also don't understand his assumptions. Uh, but the statement it's not really hard when you use under Benovikov operations. So there is uh, a canonical map from child groups of X to the braided quotient of K0 with respect to the topological filtration or co-dimension, support co-dimension filtration. And it's always subjective and assume that it's an isomorphism. Then in fact, the morphism from, uh, the corresponding morphism from child groups tensor Lazarin to the braided quotient of algebraic convergism is also an isomorphism in this particular uh, co-dimension. And the proof you, can, you, can be done only using the structure of these co-modules over this particular Hopf algebra. Um, and the corollary to that is that you can compute, um, well, first of all, this isomorphism, sorry, this isomorphism here from child groups to K0 happens, of course, in co-dimension 0, 1, and 2. Um, because there is, uh, there, there is a section coming from the chunk class. And uh, it's also true in the highest uh, co-dimension for projective varieties over an algebraically closed field due to result of Mark Levin. Um, so there are some instances when this is uh, true. 
and in small dimensions you can derive the computation of uh, curves, for example, algebraic avoidance of a curve, which was done by Vishik by different means, much more complicated than just using Klandewer and Novikov operations. That algebraic avoidance of a curve is just the Lazar ring uh, times uh, identity plus the zero cycles tensor Lazar ring. So it's sort of like Chow groups tensored with the Lazar ring. And for surfaces, it is slightly more complicated because there is a non trivial extension between child groups coming from K0. K0. Uh, but in essence, it's again not so uh, different from, from classical things. So algebraic cobordism sort of become more interesting or more complicated than the usual things only for varieties starting from dimension three and maybe even uh, for algebraically closed fields and projective varieties even dimension three, it's not much new. But even though we have computed uh, like algebraic cobordism of a curve, for example, here, we don't know the answer to the following question, at least I don't know. So suppose you have a morphism, a projective morphism from some variety to C. It gives you a class here. So using this result, you get a class in here. And you know how to compute the class, like the part here, it just comes from the generic fiber of this projective morphism. Um, and the, like the chair numbers of this generic fiber, it's a very, uh, like a topological or uh, topological thing. But then we also get lots of zero cycles here for projective morphism. And uh, I don't know how to compute them and I don't think anyone, anybody knows how to compute them, sort of. And this is a really uh, basic question which we don't know an answer for algebraic cobordism. And I think I should stop here and already over time. Okay. Let's thank Harvey. Okay, and so are there other questions? So if no one asks, I have a, a kind of a random question. Yeah. Uh, so you defined these pure omega motives earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do also some version of Wojewski motives using some kind of correspondences parameterized by, by cobordism? Right, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think personally I cannot. Um, but uh, I always forget the arguments of, well, there is a, like, I think there is an argument why the answer is not just MGL modules. That's what I want to say. I forgot the argument. Well, I mean, this thing is going to be Z linear, whatever you. you All ah, right. So, MGL modules are not going to be Z linear. Yeah, so, okay, that's also an argument for that. Well, um, I mean, we have a paper where we construct uh, a similar thing where you can take, so label the span, spans, or in this case, cos, um, cycles by e correspondences where e is any spectrum. So just taking real more um, homology space. So this is a general version of the construction, I think, that you're having in mind. But I mean, of course, in this case, it's much more explicit, but you can do something and then you don't know if it's there, the, uh, like you don't have a, well, you don't have it to comparison um, result, if I understand correctly. But I you can say- I think one that in this case, you do get MGL modules again. Say again, Tom? I mean, if you do the thing which Mora says, then I think I can prove that you do get um, right, right. MGL modules. Yeah, I think that's what we should get. Yeah, and I think that's not uh, what we want here. I shouldn't think of just putting cobordism groups. I should think of something more refined, like this. I see. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Are there further questions?
So I have maybe a comment, mm -hmm. which is that I thought about this question of Dennis. Um, and so I think the point is that in order for, I mean, in this definition of what, what, does, what does it mean to be invariant, right? So implicitly what you're using is an isomorphism between f of x, uh, I mean f of the one, I mean between f of, between f of m of x and phi of m of x. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this depends on like really having m of x and not some arbitrary motive. So gen, I mean the two functors f and phi are not isomorphic, only if you compose it with m are yeah. they isomorphic. I think this this maybe explains the confusion. Mm -hmm. no, no, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all for okay. attention. I can, I'm going to stop recording now then. Thank you for the talk again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.